He was supposed to be a doctor, but fell in love with flight as a young boy and never gave up his dream of flying. He proved himself in the war over Europe and demonstrated in a series of bold missions that he could not only fly, but lead. He played an instrumental role in the development and deployment of the B-29 Flying Fortress, and every pilot who flew that plane flew it the way he taught them. And when the Manhattan Project bore its terrible fruit, the job of ending World War II fell to him. He planned the mission, set up the training and logistics to support it, and when the president gave the order, he flew the plane that ushered in the atomic age. To think of Paul Tibbetts as just the commander of the aircraft that dropped the first atomic weapon is to do the man a little bit of a disservice. It was, a, it was truly a defining moment in the world history. But Tibbetts himself had been an outstanding pilot. He is General Paul Tibbetts. Paul Tibbetts was born in Quincy, Illinois on February 23rd, 1915. His father, a strict disciplinarian, served in World War I and never recovered from the death and destruction he witnessed there. After the war, he moved his family to Florida and got a job as far away from the military as he could, selling candy for the Curtis Candy Company. When we got old enough to know what I was talking about, why uh, my father told me I was going to become a doctor. Uh, having learned earlier not to disagree with him as openly, uh, I believed him. I believed him until I got my first airplane ride at the age of about 12. Tibbetts' first flight was over the Hialeah racetrack in Miami. He flew in a biplane and helped the pilot throw candy bars down on the crowd as promotion. His father, down on the ground, disapproved of his son's obvious love of flight. I knew that I was going to have to be a pilot. I didn't tell my dad because didn't have nerve enough at age 12 to say anything. Tibbetts' family sent him to Western Military Academy in Alton, Illinois, where he played football with future fighter ace Butch O'Hare. Tibbetts went on to the University of Florida. Florida lacked a medical school at the time, so Tibbetts transferred to the University of Cincinnati. During the summers back in Florida, he snuck off to sunny South Airfield for flying lessons. Without telling his parents, he enlisted in the Army and drove from Cincinnati to Wright Field in Dayton for a flight physical. A few weeks later, he was sworn in as a flight cadet and ordered to San Antonio for training. He took a train to Florida, dreading the conversation with his father. Finally, I got my nerve right up to peak, and I looked at him and I said, uh, I want to tell you, I'm leaving college. I'm going to go down to flying school at San Antonio, Texas, be an air, learn to be a pilot in the Army Air Corps. He looked at me, he said, you know, I've been supporting you uh, ever since you've been little, and I've been sending you through school. But since you're leaving school, you're on your own from here on. And go kill yourself, I don't give a damn. Tibbetts' mother was more understanding and encouraged him to follow his dream. But Tibbetts' relationship with his father was changed forever. And as he reported to San Antonio, he felt as if one life had ended and a new life was beginning. Tibbetts earned his wings in 1938. Clearly the outstanding pilot in his class, he surprised everyone by choosing multi-engine aircraft instead of fighters. He believed he would have more independence flying reconnaissance and spent the next two years logging hundreds of hours in ungainly observation craft. In 1941, he became group engineering officer of the 3rd Attack Group. He trained in the A-20, the Army Air Force's new low-level attack bomber. Reassigned in early December to fly B-18s on anti-submarine patrol, Tibbetts was on his way to his new base when he heard of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The entry of the United States into the war, of course, changed everything. The Army Air Force changed Tibbetts' assignment to B-17s. The training pace was frantic as Tibbetts and the other flyers struggled to learn the almost entirely new art of strategic bombing. For six months, they flew hour after hour to targets hundreds of miles away, practicing for the battles to come. After six months of dry runs and pretend bombing, with the United States newly at war and completely unprepared for what would follow, Tibbetts and the 97th Bomb Group 
got their overseas orders. In the summer of 42, Tibbets took off from Bangor, Maine to fly the Great Circle route to England. There he knew the war awaited him. When Captain Paul Tibbets arrived in Europe, England seethed with war. The Battle of Britain had been fought and won. The RAF controlled the skies over England, and the threat of a German invasion no longer loomed large. Still, the survival of Great Britain remained in enough doubt that the English exported most of their scientific research to the safer shores of North America. Among those who left were scientists working on advanced radar, and a small group of German expatriates who were gradually unraveling the secrets of the atom. Thousands of Americans flooded the countryside, taking up residence in hastily constructed air bases at the ends of mud roads. The skies were filled with bombers and fighters, an air force unlike any ever assembled, with a single mission, hit Germany and hit it hard. Though just one of hundreds of young captains, Tibbets stood out. He and his crew seemed more ready for war than the other crews. And for that reason, the Army Air Force chose him to lead the first American daylight attack against German-occupied Europe. While nominally under the command of General Ira Aker, Tibbets handled the operational details and execution. On August 17, 1942, 18 B-17s took off from England to bomb a train yard near the French city of Rouen. The mission went off without a hitch, and all 18 planes returned home safely. In late 1942, the European command tapped Tibbets to fly General Mark Clark on a secret mission from England to Gibraltar. Clark was laying the groundwork for Operation Torch, the American invasion of North Africa. Clark's mission was to meet with Admiral Darlan, the commander of the French colony of Algeria to find out if the French Navy in Algiers would resist the American invasion. Tibbets flew Clark around occupied Europe, staying low over the Atlantic Ocean the whole time. Clark's negotiations with Darlan went well, and the French Admiral agreed not to resist the American invasion. Clark returned, and with a glowing report, not only about Darlan, but also about the young pilot who had executed the dangerous flight with so little apparent trouble. So it was no surprise when a few weeks later, Tibbets got the job of flying Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower and his entourage to Gibraltar to observe the actual invasion. We're standing there waiting and it's almost midnight at night because the weatherman from the base had come in. Each time weather was chill, you know, marginal for takeoff even. They just said it was dangerous. He, last time, we're standing under the airplane, and he comes up, and he looks at General Eisenhower, and he says, General, I cannot promise you any better weather than this for the next four days. He said, it's terrible, but that's what, that's my forecast. We'll have the same thing for four days. And Eisenhower looked at Jimmy Doolittle, and he said, uh, Jimmy, what should we do? Doolittle looked right back at him and said, don't ask me, General. Paul's flying the airplane, he's the man. And uh, with that, I was looking at General Eisenhower. I said, General Eisenhower, I realize the importance of you and your staff and the people, but if I'd been here alone, I'd have been gone to this time. I wouldn't have been waiting all this time. I'd been gone. And he said, let's go. I got a war waiting on me. Tibbets took off in a pea soup fog. Eisenhower sat on a board propped between seats in the cockpit. Once again, Tibbets flew low to stay out of sight of patrolling German fighters. He covered more than a thousand miles, only a few feet above the tops of the waves. He got Eisenhower to Gibraltar just as the invasion started, only a few minutes after the first paratroops landed. The ground crew was amazed. Tibbet's plane was encrusted with salt from flying so low over the ocean. Eisenhower told his staff that Captain Tibbets was the best pilot he'd ever flown with. I had stayed pretty close to the white caps in that uh... I always talked about that. And Eisenhower later complimented me and, you know, so that sort of thing was about what a nice ride he had. And I didn't know it until just a year ago. Eisenhower held a private pilot's license. He had earned it as a first lieutenant in the Philippines. Doolittle apparently agreed with Eisenhower. 
After letting the captain fly a few more combat missions over North Africa, the general had him transferred to the 12th Air Force, which was trying to adapt to the B-26 Marauder. The Marauder was a nasty airplane, finicky in flight and difficult to control. Tibbets, however, quickly mastered the plane and seemed adept at helping those around him master the aircraft as well. Halfway around the world in Wichita, Kansas, Boeing was fighting to tame the Air Corps' newest bomber, the B-29 Super Fortress. A huge plane capable of carrying a massive bomb load, the B-29 was a strategic planner's dream that had turned into a pilot's nightmare. Since rolling off the assembly line, the B-29 had killed the only crew that knew how to fly it. The Army Air Force needed a pilot who could come in, get a handle on the plane, and in effect save what was at that time the most expensive weapon system in history. In July 1943, Tibbets reported to Boeing in Wichita. A line of B-29 sat parked on a taxiway. They were huge, technologically advanced, and, without crews to fly them, absolutely useless. Tibbets looked around, shook a few hands, and asked an engineer if he knew how to start the plane's engines. When the engineer said he could, Tibbets grabbed a pilot who was walking by and told him they were going flying. He said, I've never been in one. I don't know how to fly it. I said, it doesn't make a difference. I haven't been in one either, but we're going to fly this airplane. And with that, now, not trying to be funny, but I knew damn well if it flew like an airplane, I could fly it. Tibbets and his stunned co-pilot taxied back and forth on the runway, getting a feel for the plane. Tibbets tested the brakes and the ailerons, stopping now and then to cool the engines, which were designed for the cold temperatures at high altitude. And then, with a small crowd looking on and wondering if he had lost his mind, he took off. Over the next few days, he and his improvised crew logged 10 hours in the unflyable bomber. I did do uh, the uh, phase five flight test for the, for the factory and the government because there was nobody to fly that airplane in thunderstorms and things like that, but they wanted to measure stresses and strains. And, but I got to like the airplane and just, I was really happy with it. After mastering the aircraft and documenting its flight characteristics, Tibbets set up the school that trained every B-29 pilot who fought in the war. It was at that school that Tibbets was first approached about the mission that would etch his name forever in the history books. Walking into the ready room after flying a training mission, a mysterious captain approached him and started asking questions. Tibbets apparently gave the right answers, because after a few minutes, the captain introduced Tibbets to a second, older man. Young man. And uh, he said, uh, I want to tell you about the Manhattan Project. So he gave me an outline about split. You know, he, first off, he said, do you know anything about atoms? And I said, no. The massive research effort to design an atom bomb had been going on for years. It was called the Manhattan Project, a code name designed to mislead those who stumbled across its paper trail into thinking it had something to do with sewers in New York City. In fact, it was the most monumental engineering project in history, a crash program to turn the most esoteric area of theoretical science into a working weapon. They knew that it would do something. They knew, well, yes, it'll drop 100,000 tons of TNT, but what's 100,000 tons of TNT? Or well, how much, what, I mean, no one knew. No one ever seen that much in one place at one time. The program was, by almost any measure, an amazing success. And as the first test of a nuclear bomb approached, the last piece of the puzzle became not scientific or technical, but logistical. How to deliver the bomb to the target. Doing that was not going to be easy. There were two designs for an atom bomb, and both were too big to fit in the bomb bays of even a B-29. The explosion itself would be so large that it might incinerate the crew that delivered the weapon. So a new type of mission would have to be designed. All of this would require the assembly and training of a logistics train stretching from the United States to the target. Hundreds of crewmen, mechanics, and other support personnel working in secretive isolation. I was confident enough. I, I knew I could do it. I mean, it, it, 
at that time, I had uh, so much confidence that you can't imagine. I'd, I'd been successful in everything I'd undertaken. Uh, to put an airplane together to carry a bomb to get the people to fly and maintain them and all that sort of thing, I had no problem with them. Tubas' reputation was not only that he was extremely competent, yes, but he was also a wonderful pilot and he was also a leader of men. He had demonstrated that time and time again and he had also demonstrated his abilities firsthand to major figures in the United States Army. So they knew who this man was. Janet, it's difficult to imagine a person who would have been better qualified. Why? Or have done it better. The Army could do little to help Tibbets do his job because no one had ever done what he was charged with doing. He was given a vote of confidence that included a caveat. Do it right, you're a hero. Do it wrong, you may go to jail. Armed only with his own knowledge and a code word, silver plate, that would get him whatever he wanted without question, Tibbets went to work setting up what became the 509th Composite Group. And General Ed had told me when I left his office, he said, uh, you, you go by a window over Utah and take a look at it. If you like that place, you can have it. He said, if you don't like that, go to South, uh, forgotten where it feel is, South Dakota. And then he gave me one in Kansas and he said, if you like them, you can have them. If you don't like them, we'll hunt for one you will like. Tibbetts liked Wendover just fine. Located on the Utah-Nevada border, it was only a few hours from the Los Alamos nuclear test site, so Tibbetts' crew could support the ballistics testing of the prototype bombs. It existed in self-sufficient isolation. No one would go off base for a drink and give away any secrets. Or so Tibbetts thought until he got word from intelligence agents that a couple of his mechanics had been bragging about their secret mission in Salt Lake City. Tibbetts hauled them into his office. You know, you, you talk and you're giving your breaking security in wartime. I said, I've, I've got a debate whether I ought to put you in front of a court martial and have you shot uh, or whether to, what I would do. We'd go back to the barracks and stay there. And you're limited to the barracks and the mess hall. That's the only place that you can go. You can't go to the exchange, you can't go anywhere else. Fortunately, information about what exactly Tibbetts was doing was so tightly controlled that even the people working for him had no idea what they were working on. You had to have a green airplane, a green pass to, see, to get on an airplane. You had to have an orange pass to get into the area of the uh, ordinance people. Just to be in the camp that we had, you had to have a white pass. So everybody had everybody had three passes if they for if they were going either to the airplanes or the other uh, to the ordnance section. Well, those were very few and far between, obviously. The 509th formed officially in December 1944 and quickly grew to more than 200 officers and 1,500 men. Almost all of them completely mystified about their location, their mission, and the heavy security that surrounded them. Whoever chose Tibbetts chose well. Tibbetts is a remarkable leader. You discover this instantly if you talk to the people that he led during World War II. He is a remarkable organizer. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a leader, an organizer, an airman. He has just many personal qualities that I think just kind of stand out. Tibbetts asked for and got 15 brand new B-29s, stripped of armament and armor, modified with fast opening bomb bay doors, equipped to carry a single 10,000 pound bomb. Now, the way I worked it in the States was easy, keep them flying over the West where there's nothing, but I also got, I wanted them to get over water training and I arranged to get Batista Field in Havana, Cuba, where I could send three airplanes at a time down there. Let them stay there for a couple of weeks. They flew over water, at night, they flew over water in the daytime. They had to use the sun, both, it, all, the, all the daylight flights, they had to use the stars on the night flights. And they got very good at what they were doing. The 500 Knights started moving to the Pacific island of Tinian in the spring of 1945. Tinian was the American air base closest to Japan, and the 500 Knights set up its operations separate from everyone else on the island. The special training the crews received, it was primarily to increase accuracy, and then they also had to know that they could not use the normal technique for bombing. 
Normally, you fly straight and level over a target, you drop your weapons, and they fall below the aircraft, and they fall basically under the aircraft until they hit the ground. You cannot do that with atomic weapon because the blast will come straight up the mushroom clouds we we're familiar with. So they had to develop a new technique, and the crews had to be prepared for this, which once the weapon was dropped, the plane would immediately make a sharp turn and dive away so they would be out of the blast range. Along with his pilots and mechanics, there was a group of nuclear technicians who would assemble the bomb. President Truman was at the Potsdam conference when he was informed that the first test of a working nuclear device was a success. The explosion, far from population centers in the New Mexico desert, was like nothing the world had ever seen. On the way back from the conference, Truman gave the order to go forward with the atomic bombing of Japan. At 2 o'clock in the morning, August 6, 1945, Tibbet's plane, the Enola Gay, began its long roll down the runway on Tilian. Once in the air, the technicians aboard finished the final assembly of the bomb, which was nicknamed Little Boy. The flight was uneventful. Japanese radar detected the Enola Gay and its escort just after dawn and broadcast an alert. At 8.16, the Enola Gay's bombardier released Little Boy over the center of Hiroshima. No regrets, whatever. I've never lost a night's sleep. I've never lost 15 minutes sleep. This was war. I didn't carry the war with me. I didn't start the war. I had a job to do during wartime. And nothing personal entered into that. I was going to do what I was told to do. Tibbets put the plane into a steep dive to gain speed. Swung back in the direction he had come from. He pressed the throttles forward. And with the protective goggles he had been instructed to wear kept him from seeing his instruments, he took them off. He needed eight miles between him and the explosion for his crew to survive the shockwave. They made it, barely. And when they got back to Tenian, they were greeted as heroes. Eight days later, the war was over. The flight over Hiroshima was Colonel Paul Tibbetts' last combat mission. Summer, 1945. The war in Europe is over. But the world is not yet at peace. In the east, Japan fights on. Her imperial navy is all but ruined. Her armies are destroyed or cut off on isolated islands. Her air forces are crippled by the loss of her experienced pilots. Japan's dream of empire is shattered, but her military leaders refuse to surrender. The battle for Okinawa ended in mid-June after 82 days of ferocious fighting. From there, the Allied forces of America and Britain plan to attack the home islands of Japan. But their victory on Okinawa had come at a terrible price. More than 50,000 Allied soldiers, sailors, and airmen were dead, wounded, or missing. More than 100,000 Japanese soldiers were killed or committed suicide. And more than 100,000 Okinawan civilians, perhaps a third of the population, were dead, many of them by suicide. As Allied leaders prepared for a massive invasion of Japan's home islands, military leaders in Japan swore to fight to the very last man, woman, and child. In late July, United States President Harry Truman and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill made a fateful decision, one that they hoped would end the war as soon as possible and save both the Allies and the Japanese from the bloodbath of an invasion. On 6 August 1945, 
the Americans unleashed a weapon the likes of which had never been seen before, the atomic bomb. Six years and two billion dollars in the making, the atomic bomb would finally bring an end to the Second World War. Perhaps no mission has ever changed the course of war more definitively or abruptly than the one undertaken by the 509th Special Squadron of the U.S. Army Air Forces and the B-29 bomber called the Enola Gay. I'm Gary Sinise, and this is Missions That Changed the War. Six August, 1945, 8.10 a.m. local time. 32,000 feet above the city of Hiroshima, Japan, a lone American B-29 bomber made its way toward a point over the city's center. Dutch Van Kirk was the navigator of that lone B-29. Today, he is the last surviving member of her 12-man crew. To the day Paul Tibbetts died, he and I would argue about whether or not I volunteered for this job. He'd say, well, you, when I called you, you volunteered. I'd say, yeah, when I got my damn orders, I noticed they're dated two days before your telephone call. So much for the volunteering part. I was flying with the crew that, you know, the captain in charge of that crew couldn't handle them. His name was Rocket. And uh, nothing the matter with him, but he had two Two characters in his outfit he couldn't handle. One of them was Theodore J. Van Kirk and the other was Thomas W. Farabee. And uh, so I said, that's the crew I want. They'll do what I want them to do. Well, it worked out that way of course. That's the beginning of a long relationship uh, between the two of us. We didn't fly together too much, but we knew where each other was and all that sort of thing. When I got the bomb project, of course, they're the first two people I asked for. On that fateful morning in Hiroshima, Japanese authorities ignored that lone bomber. It was too high for fighters or anti-aircraft fire. And besides, a single enemy bomber was not much cause for concern. At precisely 8.15 and 17 seconds, Bombardier Tom Farabee released a single five-ton object from the aircraft's bomb bay. Freed of its heavy load, the B-29 surged upward. Sergeant Wyatt Dusenberry, the flight engineer, pushed the throttles forward and the pilot, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, banked the aircraft left into a gut-wrenching turn that would take it far away from the target as quickly as possible. It was an evasive maneuver the crew had practiced many times. The object fell for 43 seconds through the clear air toward its aiming point, the T-shaped AEOE bridge. At 1,890 feet above the waking city of Hiroshima, the object known to its builders as the Little Boy erupted in an unimaginable burst of heat and light, a single weapon with the power of 13 to 18,000 tons of high explosive TNT. In an instant, its 1,200-foot fireball reached 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Near ground zero, sand melted into glass, and every living thing was vaporized or turned instantly to carbon. A full mile from the center of the blast, the shockwave turned buildings into shrapnel. In the cockpit of the Enola Gay, nine miles from the blast, it was as if a thousand flashbulbs had popped off all at once. In the tail, gunner Bob Karen 
winced in pain and tore off the special goggles issued to the crew. Even through the polarized welding glass lenses, he feared he had been struck blind by what he later described as the fire of a thousand suns. Of all the Enola Gay's crew, Karen had the best view of the blast. To the rest of the crew, he described a roiling, fiery mushroom-shaped cloud that boiled up 30, 40, 50,000 feet. A moment later, the first shockwave from the blast hit the airplane, shaking the huge bomber like a leaf in a gale. The aircraft was shaken a second time as the shockwave rebounded off the earth below, but the Enola Gay held together. Deke Parsons, the Enola Gay's weaponeer and bomb commander, sent a coded message to Tinian. The mission was a success. Below, the city had vanished beneath a boiling pall of dirty brown smoke. Flames were erupting everywhere. Karen likened it to bubbling molasses or the fires of hell. Colonel Tibbetts turned the plane broadside to the blast to give the crew a better view. While Karen wrestled with a bulky K-20 camera, the rest of the 12-man crew was mostly silent. The first thing we saw was a mushroom-shaped cloud, so-called mushroom-shaped cloud. All different colors within the base of that cloud. And on top of it was a mushroom, you could see. It was up well above our altitude already, I guess. Yeah, 40,000 going higher. And then as we turned on around and everything, we could see the city of Hiroshima, and we could make absolutely no visual observation because the entire city was covered with thick black smoke and everything. You want a description of it? I say it looked like a pot of boiling oil down there. As Tibbetts turned the Enola Gay toward Tinian and home, many of the men on board shared a single thought. This could be the end of the war. As they headed back to their base at Tinian, Six hours away in the Marianas Islands, the men aboard the Enola Gay were awestruck by what they had seen. They struggled to find the words to describe it. From the tail, Karen could see the mushroom cloud for more than an hour. Finally, 400 miles from Hiroshima, he reported to the rest of the crew that the cloud was no longer visible. As the plane flew southward across the featureless Pacific Ocean, conversation dwindled among the crew as the excitement of the mission wore off. We were all so damn tired we were coming back. We did, it didn't, didn't make any difference what mood we were in, for crying out loud. From Tinian, Captain Parson's radio message was forwarded to the Pentagon. President Harry Truman was aboard the USS Augusta, returning from a meeting with Britain's Winston Churchill and Russia's Joseph Stalin. During lunch with a group of enlisted men, Truman was handed a copy of the message from Tinian. This, he exclaimed, is the greatest thing in history. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. Aboard the Enola Gay, the crew talked of the end of the war. Some speculated that it might be all over by the time they landed at Tinian. How could the Japanese fight on? Everybody said they can but not possibly stand up to force like this. In fact, Dick Nelson made it much simpler. He said, this war is over. The atomic bomb was an entirely new weapon, more complex, more sophisticated, and more deadly than any weapon system that had come before it. The airplane that delivered the atomic bomb was equally innovative, a technological marvel. At the time, it was the largest and most sophisticated aircraft ever flown. With its large bomb load and very long range, the B-29 was designed and built for just one purpose, to strike at the very heart of Imperial Japan. In 1939, with the threat of war gathering in Europe, 
the Army Air Corps requested design proposals for a very long-range super bomber. Things looked so bad in Europe that it would look like Great Britain would be defeated and occupied by the Nazis. And the United States would have to bomb Europe from uh, the uh, United States. And so there came into being the idea of the Intercontinental Bomber. Now, it was ultimately realized in the B-36, but it set everybody's minds thinking. Boeing Aircraft Company had a set of brilliant engineers. They had done a whole series of design studies that led ultimately to the B-29. They incorporated in it so many things that would otherwise be regarded as too risky to involve into a single design to get the performance that they thought they would need. Uh, they incorporated pressurization in a bomber. They incorporated new engines, new propellers, new fire control systems, new metallurgy, new types of uh, aluminum in it. Everything was, was pushed to an extreme. When it came into being, it had a very checkered career. There were constant problems with engine fires and so on. And yet, without a doubt, it was the most advanced bomber of the war. So it was, it was the supreme bomber of, of World War II. Boeing's B-17 bomber could carry up to 8,000 pounds of bombs and had a maximum range of 2,000 miles at a top speed below 300 miles per hour. For its new super bomber, the Army Air Corps specified a bomb load of 20,000 pounds, a top speed of 400 miles per hour, and a range of over 5,000 miles. The B-29 would be the largest and most complex aircraft of the Second World War it would extend the range of strategic bombing over distances never before seen in combat. With its pressurized compartments, automated gun controls, huge engines, and immense size and range, B-29 was, in its day, one of the most complicated pieces of movable machinery ever manufactured. And it was designed, built, tested, refined, and ready for combat in just four years. Building the B-29 was not a simple task. Thousands of subcontractors fed parts to the five main assembly plants, two in Washington state and one each in Georgia, Kansas, and Nebraska. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941 and brought the United States fully into World War II, the XB-29 prototypes were not yet completed, but the Army was already impressed with the design. One month after Pearl Harbor, the B-29 went into full production with an order for 500 aircraft. The prototypes had not yet been flown. In the first months of the war, it was clear to American military planners that no other bomber had the necessary range to strike decisively at the heart of Japan. And the Army pressured Boeing to complete the B-29s in record time but the Air Corps requirements for the B-29 were challenging. Its design was highly advanced, and the aircraft was plagued with problems. Throughout the B-29's development, and for much of its service life, the most common source of problems was the engines. The Wright R-3350 duplex cyclo was one of the most powerful radial engines ever built. With its 18 air-cooled turbocharged cylinders in two rows, this mammoth produced up to 3,700 horsepower. But it had problems. The rear cylinders tended to overheat and cause engine fires. The crankcase was made of high magnesium alloy. It burned so intensely that it could burn through the main wings bar in seconds with predictable and catastrophic results. Once it was airborne, the B-29 could fly on just two of its four engines, but the failure of a single engine during takeoff could be disastrous with a full combat load of bombs and fuel. Other problems included uneven distribution of the air-fuel mixture to the cylinders and the engine's tendency to eat its own valves. During World War II, 
Nearly all B-29s operated in the tropics, where high temperatures on the runway increased the risk of engine fires and reduced aircraft performance. Engineers at Boeing and Curtis Wright tried many fixes, but the B-29's engine problems continued until the introduction of the 28-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R4360, which came too late for World War II. During the war, mechanics in the field scrambled to keep up with the fixes ordered by the engineers, including replacing the five top cylinders on each engine every 25 hours of engine time and replacing each entire engine every 75 hours. It was hardly standard practice to put an airplane into production before its prototype had been built and flown. Through 1942 and 43, as bugs in the design were discovered and fixed, many changes were applied on the production line. The B-29 is just one example of progress being accelerated by the demands of war. By the end of 1943, production was in full swing, but there were so many changes that the B-29s coming off the production line were flown straight to modification depots for extensive refits. Bad weather and other delays meant that in early 1944, Boeing had built nearly 100 B-29s, but fewer than 15 were airworthy. General Hap Arnold, commander of the Air Corps, stepped in to tighten the screws, and by mid-April, 150 B-29s were ready for deployment. At B-17, you always put your oxygen mask on when you, you wore your oxygen mask continuously. If you moved around, you had to take a portable bottle with you, and uh, it was cold, it was uncomfortable, it was noisy. I could give you a lot of things wrong with it. Power settings had to be calculated precisely and frequently for best performance. Getting the right takeoff and landing speeds was especially critical based on weight, air temperature, and field elevation. But all the extra charts and arithmetic paid off in more speed and longer range. The most revolutionary feature of the B-29 was its Central Fire Control System, or CFCS. Each of the four gun turrets mounted two 50 caliber machine guns. Each turret could be controlled by any one of four analog computers, one in the nose and three in the pressurized waste compartment. The fifth gunner, in the tail, could control his own pair of 50 caliber machine guns or the guns in the rear ventral turret. The crewman in the rear dorsal turret was the central fire control gunner, who assigned the turrets to each of the other gunners. The computer-controlled gun sight for each turret compensated for the B-29 speed, the target's speed and angle, temperature, humidity, and gravity. The analog gun sight computer was highly advanced for its time and gave B-29 gunners an effective kill range of 1,000 yards, twice the range of a manually aimed gun turret. Paul Warfield Tibbetts, Jr., the man who would later become a U.S. Air Force and aviation icon as the commander of the first ever atomic bomb mission, was born in Quincy, Illinois on 23 February 1915. The family moved to Iowa in 1918, where Tibbetts' father worked in his family's grocery business. When young Paul was nine, his father moved the family to Miami, Florida, and, with a partner, started a successful wholesale candy company. In the summer of 1927, Doug Davis, a barnstorming pilot, was under contract with the Curtis Candy Company to fly over county fairs, horse races, and other public events and drop its new Baby Ruth candy bars from his airplane. In Miami, Davis came to see the elder Tibbetts, who was the distributor for Curtis Candies. Young Paul sat in on the meeting and was enthralled by the dashing pilot. Davis needed someone to ride along in his airplane and drop the candy. Young Paul volunteered. Reluctant at first, his father agreed. He looked at my father and said, Mr. Tibbetts, I have to have somebody fly with me in the front seat and throw these bars out 
while I fly from the back seat, I'll throw them out there. And of course, I held my hand up right away. My father looked at me and he said, no, not you. And uh, my dad's business partner said, Paul, let him go, for God's sake, let him go. And uh, Doug Davis spoke up at the time. He said, Mr. Timothy said, uh, I'm married. I got a lovely wife with two lovely girls, daughters. And he said, uh, I'm going out there flying this airplane just like it should be flowing. And I'm not going to hurt myself, and I'm sure not going to hurt him. And my father relented and said, OK. And that was gave me my first ride, throwing candy bars out over the Hialeah racetrack. Well, I'm fascinated by that machine. I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. As they flew over the local racetrack just after the second race, Paul threw out handfuls of the sweets. The baby Ruths landed on target, and as the crowd scrambled for the goodies, Davis made two more bomb runs over the track before heading downtown to the beach. They flew similar missions every day for a week before Davis moved on to another city. He later joined Eastern Airlines and became its most famous pilot, helping to pioneer air travel in the U.S. Young Paul Tibbetts never forgot the excitement of those flights over Miami. In 1928, as young Tibbetts prepared for eighth grade, his father sent him to Western Military Academy in Alton, Illinois, where he would spend the next five school years. At first, Tibbetts rankled at the discipline of the academy, but eventually he chose to make the best of it. He became a good student and an average athlete. He had a few run-ins with the cadet commander over various infractions, but the fairness with which he was disciplined made a lasting impression, and it would influence his own style as a commander in World War II. In later life, he described his five years at the academy as distasteful, but he also believed that they were useful in preparing him for the challenges he would face as an adult. The summer before he started college, Tibbetts hung around Miami's Opalaka Airport, fueling planes and doing chores to earn money for flying lessons. He soloed that summer in a Taylor Cub after six hours of dual instruction. After five years of military school, Tibbetts had trouble adjusting to the freewheeling college life, and he nearly flunked out of the University of Florida. As a pre-med student at the University of Cincinnati, he helped out in a local clinic and spent his free time flying for the fun of it. Tibbetts found himself less and less enthusiastic about his chosen career in medicine and more and more excited about aviation. As Tibbetts pondered his future in late 1936, Douglas Aircraft Company introduced the DC-3 airliner. Suddenly, commercial air travel went from daring to safe and reliable, and Tibbetts found his calling. Lacking the funds for a commercial pilot's license, he applied to be a cadet in the Army Air Corps and was inducted in February 1937. I said, Dad, I'm uh, going to be leaving school. He tried to look at me, leaving school, what for? Well, I want, I'm going down to San Antonio to become a flying cadet and learn to fly airplanes in the Army Air Corps. He said, well, you're over 21, I guess that's all right. But he said, I want to remind you of something. He said, uh, going back for a long time, I've supported you pretty well. I bought your clothes and done everything for you, put shoes on your feet and all that. But he said, now that's finished. You're on your own. The Army he reasoned, would teach him to fly and launch him on a career as an airline pilot. It never occurred to him that he might fly in combat. At Randolph Field in Texas, he was determined not to wash out. His five years at Alton had taught him all about military discipline and spit and polish. If following the rules was the key to success, he would follow them to the letter, avoiding every temptation to slack off or show off. Tibbetts finished basic training at the head of his class and received the Army Air Wings in February 1938. 
As a top graduate, he was given his choice of assignment, pursuit, as fighters were called then, or observation. There were no bomber pilots in the Air Corps in those days. On the advice of one of the tactical officers at Randolph, he chose observation. That would open the door to solo missions and multi-engine training. During advanced training at Fort Benning, Georgia, Tibbetts met a pretty department store clerk named Lucy Wingate. They were married in June 1938. After completing his advanced multi-engine training, Tibbetts stayed at Fort Benning, flying the Martin B-10 bomber, mostly towing gunnery targets. In early 1940, the Air Corps' third attack group received the new Douglas A-20 Havoc. To fly the high-performance attack bomber, the Army searched for pilots with 1,000 hours or more of multi-engine time. Tibbetts' name was on that list. He was transferred to the group's base at Hunter Field near Savannah and assigned as engineering officer for the 90th Attack Squadron. In 1940, the focus was on Europe, not Japan and the Pacific. In occupied Europe, the Germans were building flak towers up to 100 feet high and mounting anti-aircraft guns on top of them. Pilots in the third attack group learned to fly their A-20 Havocs at high speed in tight formations at 100 feet or less above the ground. That would allow them to fly below the German flak towers hugging terrain to avoid enemy gunners and plane spotters. Tibbets enjoyed the challenge. It required steady nerves and precise flying skills. By 1941, it was becoming clear to many Americans that the war was coming. The U.S. was organizing its civil defense system for warning of air attacks. Tibbets' 90th Squadron was charged with putting the new system to the test. Their simulated low-level attacks on cities like Boston and New York showed that the system was woefully inadequate. Theoretically, Tibbetts later wrote, he and his squadron destroyed most of the East Coast. Attacking coastal cities, roaring in on the wave tops in tight formation at 200 miles per hour, the A-20s would sometimes nudge each other, a wingtip denting a fuselage or propeller nibbling at an elevator. But there were no serious accidents, and the pilots of the 90th Squadron became experts at low-level tactics. Tibbets was on a return flight to the squadron's base at Savannah when he heard the news that the Japanese had attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Tibbets was selected for training in the new B-17 bomber, and the B-17s were slow in coming. He was temporarily assigned to form an anti-submarine patrol unit flying Douglas B-18 bombers. As American war production geared up, the big flying fortresses began to arrive, along with the crews that would fly them. The B-17 was the largest land plane of its day, and some people thought it was too big and too complex for regular Army Air Corps crews to handle. Tibbets was given command of the 40th Squadron of the 97th Heavy Bomb Group at McDill Field in Tampa, Florida. It was his task to prepare his green B-17 air crews for combat. It was an exhausting job. Tibbets sometimes flew 18 hours a day checking out the new pilots. There was little time and few resources to turn the raw airmen into effective combat crews. Now the training was nothing. You just flew the airplane around. You'd take barrels out in the Gulf of Mexico and drop them into water and they'd fly around and shoot at them. That was our training. Uh, we had no gunnery training or anything. Most of the time we didn't have ammunition to train. When we got to England, we were the blind leading the blind. Believe me, we were. Too soon, Tibbets' squadron was ordered to the West Coast, bound for the Pacific. We got orders to go to Fresno, California. Now, the group commander was not with me, but he got on the telephone. He called me. He said, Paul, you're going to get orders to go to Fresno, California. I am in Pennsylvania here at Olmstead with the other two squadrons, which I knew. He said, I will get the message, I will send one message to you about where to go, and I will join you later. 
I got my message. We got in the airplanes. We started for Fresno, California. During their few weeks in Fresno, California, Tibbetts drilled his men constantly in formation flying, navigation, and other critical skills. But when their orders came, the 97th Bomb Group was sent back across the country to Bangor, Maine. In early June, they were finally ordered to England. On 17 August 1942, Tibbetts led 18 B-17s on the first daylight raid by American bombers on German-occupied Europe. Their target was the railroad marshalling yards at Rouen, France. Prior to that raid, British and American bombers had been striking German-occupied targets only at night. The Germans at Rouen were not expecting a daylight raid. Tibbets and his bombers caught them by surprise that day. About half the squadron's bombs hit their targets at Rouen. Their accuracy was less than was hoped for, but it was still much better than nighttime raids were achieving. Two of Tibbets' bombers were damaged by flak. Their Spitfire escorts drove off three German fighters. All the bombers returned safely to England. The only injuries were caused by a pigeon that smashed through the nose of one plane, pelting the bombardier and navigator with shards of plexiglass. In October, Tibbets led B-17s and B-24s to Lille, France. It was the first time more than 100 bombers were joined in a single raid. Dutch Van Kirk, who had become Tibbetts' navigator, entered the Army Air Corps cadet program in October 1941 and earned his navigator's wings six months later at Kelly Field in Texas. After about a week there, maybe two weeks, they called out a bunch of names of a about 30 people, and they got us together and they said, you people are going through here in half the normal time. Well, they forgot to, and doubled up on the calisthenics as well as the classes and everything else. They could almost kill us for heaven's sakes. So they, we finally convinced them they only needed the regular calisthenics, and, but we went through in double time, and we almost all went to the 97th bomb group over there. Uh, my first combat mission, we didn't get any enemy action. So I come back and I thought, oh, this is snap. No touching to it. And I think it was maybe the third or fourth mission that uh, I changed my mind. I've been looking out the window on my right, on the right hand side. We had two guns up there, one out the right, one out the left, and a 30 caliber out the nose. And we never hit a damn thing, but that's okay. I was looking out the window on the right hand side. I turned around and looked back a little bit look out the window on the left-hand side. By the time I turned around, looked back out the window on the right-hand side, there were four bullet holes where my head had been. And I decided, they're shooting at me. I earned my money today. So from that on, we, we knew we were in a war. That October, Tibbetts, now a lieutenant colonel, was given the job of flying General Mark Clark from England to Algeria to meet with French commanders prior to Operation Torch, the American invasion of North Africa. Tibbets stayed in North Africa flying bombing missions when it moved to Algiers. In January of 1943, he became Chief of Bomber Operations for General Jimmy Doolittle, who commanded the 12th Air Force in Africa. Less than a month later, General Hap Arnold, commander of the Army Air Forces, asked Doolittle to send back to the States his best field grade officer with most experience in B-17s. The Air Forces had a problem, and Paul Tibbets was just the man to fix it. Arriving in Washington in late February 1943, Tibbets learned that the Army Air Force's newest bomber, the B-29, was in serious trouble. The aircraft was plagued with problems, mostly related to the newly developed Wright R-3350 engines. In July, Tibbets was sent to New Mexico to test the B-29 bomber's combat characteristics with P-47 fighters making simulated attacks. The big bomber was hard to control in the thin air at high altitudes it would be impossible to fly in tight combat box formations. 
Tibbets began to doubt the airplane's ability to survive in combat. On a day when his regular test plane was out of service, he borrowed a stripped-down B-29. Without its 7,000 pounds of guns and ammunition, the plane flew higher and faster and was much easier to control. Above 30,000 feet, the Lighten B-29 could turn tighter than a P-47 and could outrun the fighters. It was an important lesson that he would later put to good use. In September 1944, Tibbets was called to Colorado Springs to organize and train a bomber group for a super secret mission, one that might end the war. The Manhattan Project, America's program to develop an atomic bomb, was far enough along that figuring out how to deliver the weapon and training the crews to do it had become an urgent concern. The Army Air Force did not want a suicide mission. Tibbet's job was to figure out how to deliver the bomb safely and to assemble a bomb group specially trained to drop the weapon. He was to prepare two special bomber squadrons, one for Japan and one for Germany. Tibbets would get whatever men and resources he needed. If anyone refused, the code word silver plate would breach all barriers. As his base, Tibbets chose Wendover Field in Utah. The facilities were adequate and very isolated. USO comedian Bob Hope called it leftover field. The men called it the end of nowhere. As the core of his 509th composite group, Tibbets chose the 393rd Bomber Squadron, a combat-ready B-29 unit. And he began bringing in the best crewmen from his B-17 days. Bombardier Tom Faraby, navigator Dutch Van Kirk, flight engineer Wyatt Dusenberry and tail gunner Bob Karen. These men formed Tibbet's own B-29 crew and helped to train the other crews. It really came home to me when you saw, when they were describing what you were going to do, that you were going to do something that would destroy an entire city. It could be you're going to shorten the war or end the war. And you saw a bunch of guys running around who you knew were nuclear physicists. How many people in the organization knew enough about atomic energy at that time to guess that we were working on an atomic bomb is beyond me. Security was extremely tight. Only Tibbets knew the unit's true purpose and the men were cautioned, don't talk to anyone and don't even be curious. You didn't talk about it because if you did, you would get Send up the illusions, there's no place like that. How does one drop an atomic bomb and get away safely? The scientists came to us and right at the beginning, and they, one of them said, we think you will be okay if you're nine miles away when the bomb explodes. I can remember looking at the guy and saying, what the hell do you mean you think? We could be wrong. Some guys are saying it could be 50 miles away. Some people are saying you can't get far enough away. The bomb would be released from six miles high. A steep turn of 155 degrees and a shallow dive for speed would put the plane about nine miles away from the explosion. Immediately we decided we wanted to use stripped down B-29s. These were B-29s had all the turrets taken out, all the guns taken out except the tail guns, as much of the weight as we could get out of that B-29, take it out and get rid of it so it could get up higher and go faster. We could not have done this mission in a regular B-29. With stripped down B-29s, the crews dropped dummy bombs and practiced navigation and the evasion maneuver that Tibbets had worked out. Germany surrendered on 8 May, 1945. The 509th Composite Group now had only one target, Japan. They were ready but at Los Alamos, the scientists argued about the odds. A one in 10,000 chance that the bomb's trigger would fail. They wanted one in a million. Tibbets said he would take 10,000 to one any day, and he gave the order to move the bombers to Tinian, 1,500 miles from Japan. The pieces were in place for a mission that might 
end the war. Most people have no concept of why we dropped the bombs at the time we did. They just assume that we dropped the bombs in order to cause those large casualties. They do not take time to read it and understand it. And no matter what you tell them, I don't think they're, the most people will never understand it. You go to high schools today, and the high schools today don't understand anything about World War II. I've, I think I did describe how I was introduced at once high school and as, a, as a veteran of World War XI. There had been no other mission like it in history. The use of an atomic bomb for strategic purposes in time of war. The complexity and destructive power of the weapon is well documented. That the little boy dropped on Hiroshima and the fat man dropped on Nagasaki three days later caused the Japanese leadership to change its policy of defending the home islands to the last man, woman, and child to one of immediate surrender is a matter of historical fact. It is a singular story of technological genius and the fog of war, magnificent courage and terrible suffering, diligent planning and unpredictable happenstance. The mission of the B-29 bomber called the Enola Gay and its crew on August 6, 1945, not only changed the Second World War, it changed the face of warfare as we know it until this day. It was, in fact, a mission that changed human history. I'm Gary Sinise. And this is Missions That Changed the War. The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress, the airplane that dropped the atomic bomb, was as much a technological marvel as the bomb itself. It featured innovations like a pressurized cabin, an electronic fire control system, and remote-controlled gun turrets. Its wingspan, 141 feet, was nearly twice the span of Boeing's B-17 Flying Fortress. At 155,000 pounds combat weight, the B-29 was one of the largest aircraft to serve in World War II. It went from drawing board to combat in less than four years. It went into full production before its prototype flew, and the first B-29s to come off the assembly line were full of problems. But eventually, it became a very capable strategic bomber, and it served the U.S. Air Force through the end of the 1950s. In late 1944, the United States was well on the way to developing an atomic bomb the U.S. Army Air Forces created a special B-29 bomber group to deliver the bomb. The 509th Composite Group. Its leader was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts, one of the 8th Air Force's most experienced B-17 pilots and a test pilot for the B-29 program. Tibbetts was tasked with organizing and training two special bomb units, one for Germany and one for Japan. As the core of his 509th Composite Group, he chose the 393rd Bomber Squadron, a combat-ready unit of 15 B-29s. 
In an archival interview, Paul Tibbetts talked about the mission. You got a tremendous amount of responsibility there. You got a tremendous amount of authority. Be careful of how you use it. We're in General Ant's office and he is instructing me as to uh, my assignment. You are going to organize and train a unit to drop these atomic bombs simultaneously in both Europe and Japan. And uh, he told me about using my code word of silver plate, but he said General Arnold had advised his entire staff in Washington that any requisition with the word silver plate would be honored without question. I reflected back over the things that had been said, knowing that it was going to be the most important thing that I ever did in my life. He added three more factory fresh B-29s to the group, personally selecting his own aircraft from Boeing's production line. One of his main concerns was how to drop an atomic bomb and get away safely. The bomb would be dropped from 30,000 feet and it would explode 43 seconds later. Tibbets worked out an evasive maneuver that would get his bomber nine miles from the blast. The scientists came to us and right at the beginning and they, one of them said, we think you will be okay if you're nine miles away when the bomb explodes. I can remember looking at the guy and saying, what the hell do you mean you think? We could be wrong. Some guys are saying it could be 50 miles away. Some people are saying you can't get far enough away. So you just paid your money, you took your choice. The 509th trained at an isolated airfield at Wendover, Utah. Their mission was super secret. Only Tibbets and a handful of officers knew what they were training for, though others may have guessed. We had every telephone coming into Wendover, Utah, or going out, it was tapped. Security was the most important thing that we had to maintain because they didn't want anything to get out. Tibbets cautioned the men of the 509th not to talk to anyone about the unit and not to speculate about its purpose. Violators quickly found themselves transferred to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska where they could talk as much as they liked to the walruses and seagulls. The air crews practiced navigation and dropped practice bombs called pumpkins that were shaped like the bulbous atomic bomb but filled with conventional high explosives. For maximum altitude and speed, they stripped their B-29s, dumping 7,000 pounds of gun turrets, ammunition, and other gear. Their only remaining armaments were their tail guns. By April 1945, it was clear that the war in Europe was in its final days. The bombers of the 509th now had just one target, Japan. In early May, they began shipping out to Tinian, an island in the Marianas Group, 1,200 miles from the Japanese homeland. Tinian is a 39-square-mile coral island, roughly 5 by 13 miles, in the northern Marianas Island chain. 3,700 miles from Hawaii. Claimed by Japan after World War I, it was mainly a sugar plantation under Japanese rule. During World War II, the Japanese built two small airfields and launched fighters and light bombers from the island. U.S. Marines invaded the island in July 1944 and secured it on August 1st. 8,000 Japanese soldiers died in the nine-day battle. The Marines lost 328 dead and 1,500 wounded. Several hundred Japanese soldiers remained hidden in Tinian's semi-tropical jungles. The last survivor was captured in 1953. With Tinian secured, 15,000 Seabees moved in to build runways and prepare camps for 50,000 personnel. They built two airfields for the B-29s, a total of six 8,500-foot runways, said to be the longest runways in the world at the time. Tinian became the busiest military airfield in the war. Mass bombing raids from Tinian began in November 1944. On the night of 10 March 1945, 279 B-29s flying below 6,000 feet dropped 1,700 tons of bombs on Japan's capital city, Tokyo. 
the bombs ignited a firestorm that destroyed 16 square miles of the city and killed at least 100,000 Japanese. 14 B-29s were lost. These massed raids continued until the end of the war. On Tinian, the 509th was again shrouded in secrecy. While other B-29 units flew low-level airstrikes on Japan, from which some crews did not return, the planes of the 509th flew milk runs, dropping their pumpkin-shaped bombs from high altitude, far out of reach of enemy fighters and flak. Other units began to view Tibbet's crews as pampered misfits who contributed nothing to the war effort. When word slipped out that the group's mission might end the fighting, someone wrote a satirical song called The 509th is Winning the War. In truth, the group's station on Tinian was not hardship duty. The hours were long and the work was hard, but there were white coral beaches and a hospital full of pretty nurses to provide recreation. In mid-July, the 509th began flying missions to Japan, dropping their pumpkin bombs on military and industrial targets. In contrast to the huge low-level raids, the 509th sent only two or three bombers at a time over Japan and bombed in daylight from high altitude, around 30,000 feet. The Japanese began to ignore these daytime attacks. After all, two or three bombs did little damage compared to the massive nighttime raids. On 17 July, Tibbets received a coded message from General Groves, head of the Manhattan Project. The atom bomb test had been successful. Scientists had set off the world's first atomic explosion at Almogordo, New Mexico. Up to then, it had all been theories and high hopes. Now, the super weapon was a reality. From Tinian, Colonel Tibbetts made three round trips to Washington between May and July to work out problems and to discuss target selection for the atom bomb. At first, the list of possible targets included the cities of Kyoto, Hiroshima, Yokohama, and Kokura. All of these cities were important industrial or military centers, and all had been spared from conventional bombing. Kyoto was taken off the list when Secretary of State Henry Stinson pointed out that it had great historic and religious significance to the Japanese. Remember, up to this time, they had a target committee, and there were a lot of people picking out targets and everything else. These targets, which had, had never before been bombed by any other means, and, um, I knew the five of them beforehand, but I didn't know which one it would be. But we were all in favor of Hiroshima. That was a, where we could do the most good with one bomb that we were going to drop and everything else. That's because the, the second army was there, you don't, probably don't realize it, but 25% of the people killed in Hiroshima were military people. And then you had materiel that was going over to uh, Shikoku for the defense of Japan and everything else. You, you could probably do more good at bombing that than you could have any other city. The 509th continued to fly practice missions to Japan, dropping their black powder bombs configured in shapes similar to the anticipated atomic bomb. In mid-July, Tibbets learned that the atomic mission might be given to a different B-29 unit. Colonel Butch Blanchard, the senior operations officer on Tinian, had argued that other B-29 crews were more experienced and more qualified. Tibbets countered that the 509th had been training specifically for the atomic bomb mission and were fully competent to fly it. He offered to take Blanchard on a practice mission to prove his point. With Blanchard in the jump seat, Tibbets flew to nearby Rota Island, still held by the Japanese. The Tibbets plane arrived at its target precisely on time and dropped its simulated atom bomb precisely on target. With the bomb away, Tibbets snapped the big bomber into the evasive maneuver his crews had practiced. 
Blanchard turned pale as the G-forces pinned him to his seat. He declared that he'd seen enough. The 509th would drop the atom bomb. The B-29 was not supposed to hold like other, uh, together under that maneuver, we later found out. Make the turn when you're coming off is steep enough so your tail starts to stall. Then you know you have the turn steep enough. And it's a push the throttles forward, lose a th couple thousand feet in the turn, and just run like hell. In the second half of July, the 509th made a dozen conventional raids on Japanese cities, dropping the simulated atom bombs. Bulbous, pumpkin-shaped casings filled with black powder or other conventional explosives. The raids avoided cities that were on the atom bomb target list. Their strange tactics, just two or three bombers at high altitude, confused the Japanese. Fighters almost never tried to intercept the bombers, and anti-aircraft fire couldn't reach the B-29s at 30,000 feet. Gradually, the Japanese became accustomed to seeing small groups of bombers that didn't cause much damage. Although some of the pumpkin-shaped bombs were aimed by radar onto cloud-covered targets, it was decided that the atomic bomb would only be dropped if the target were clearly visible to the bombardier. Colonel Tibbets was prohibited from flying these practice missions to Japan. General Curtis LeMay, who commanded all B-29 combat operations against Japan, declared that Tibbets was too valuable to the atom bomb mission and knew too much to risk falling into Japanese hands. The pumpkin raids proved to Tibbets that his crews were ready for the atom bomb mission. They could deliver the bomb precisely on time and precisely on target. The practice bombing missions also revealed a potentially serious problem in the bomb's design. The fuse that ignited the bombs was a radar-actuated proximity fuse that was supposed to detonate the bomb at 1,890 feet above the ground. But on two occasions, the fuse detonated its pumpkin bomb too soon. Once over Wendover and once over the Pacific, the bombs detonated just after leaving the bomb bay at 31,000 feet. The premature explosions did no damage to the planes, but they caused some serious worry among the crews. Tibbets made the last trip to Washington in mid-July. There, it was decided that everything would be ready by the first week of August. Tibbets flew back to Tinian to oversee the final preparations for the mission. On the morning of 26 July, the cruiser USS Indianapolis arrived at Tinian to deliver the firing mechanism and a small slug of uranium for the atomic bomb. The second slug of uranium was delivered by a B-29 from the United States. Halfway between Guam and the Leyte Gulf, in the early hours of July 30, the Indianapolis was hit by two Japanese torpedoes. Of the nearly 900 men who went into the water on July 30, only 317 were rescued. It was the worst sea disaster in the history of the U.S. Navy. Back on Tinian, the technicians continued to prepare what some were calling the device. Its final assembly would be done on the day before the mission. We never call it an atomic bomb at all. How many people in the organization knew enough about atomic energy at that time to guess that we were working on an atomic bomb is beyond me. But if you did, if you guessed it, you didn't talk about it. Because if you did, you would get sent up the illusions. There's no place like that. Fat Man, like the atomic bomb tested at Almogordo, New Mexico in mid-July, was an implosion-type plutonium bomb. A 
a sphere of shaped explosive charges surrounded a smaller sphere of radioactive plutonium. When the explosive charges detonated, the pressure of the explosion compressed the plutonium sphere to critical mass, setting off an uncontrolled atomic reaction. Fat Man would be the second atomic bomb used in combat. The bomb that would be dropped on Hiroshima was of a different type than the one tested in New Mexico. This was a rifle-type bomb in which one slug of uranium would be fired into another. The pressure of their impact would push both slugs of uranium to critical mass and trigger the explosion. Little Boy was a simpler design and the scientists considered it more reliable than the implosion-type Fat Man. But in fact, a rifle-type atomic bomb like Little Boy had never been tested. Its first use as a weapon would also be its first trial run. America, China, and Britain sent the so-called Potsdam Proclamation to Japan on 26 July. Surrender, it said, or face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese ignored it. Three days later, General Carl Tui Spatz arrived on Tinian to take command of the U.S. strategic forces in the Pacific. He brought with him a signed order from General Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project. The order authorized the 509th Composite Group to, quote, deliver its first special bomb as soon as weather will permit visual bombing after about 3 August 1945, unquote. The target was to be one of four cities, Hiroshima, Kokura, Nagata, or Nagasaki. Paul Tibbets favored Hiroshima. In a handwritten note on the margin of the order, President Truman wrote, quote, release when ready, but not sooner than August 2, unquote. Truman was meeting in Potsdam, Germany with Allied leaders Churchill and Stalin in early August and did not want the bomb dropped until that meeting was over. I was never challenged, nobody ever asked me, uh, can I drop the bomb or, you know, have you made a decision who's going to drop it? If they had, I'd have told them yes, decision was made the first day I heard about it, and that's going to be me. Colonel Paul Tibbets would fly the first atomic bomb mission with a hand-picked crew. Captain Bob Lewis, age 25, from Richfield Park, New Jersey, would be Tibbetts' co-pilot. Lewis had often commanded the aircraft when Tibbetts was busy with other duties. Theodore Dutch Van Kirk, navigator, age 24, from Northumberland, Pennsylvania, and Major Tom Faraby, bombardier, age 24, from Moxville, North Carolina. Both men had been part of Tibbetts' regular B-17 flight crew in England. Tom Faraby was the best poker player I ever saw in the Army. And that's saying a lot. Best crap shooter, too. We met in the nose of a B-17. We were best friends until he died. Captain William Deke Parsons, age 44, from Chicago, was a U.S. Navy ordnance expert who had worked on the Manhattan Project. He would be responsible for arming and monitoring the atomic bomb during the flight to Japan. He was assisted by Lieutenant Morris R. Jepson, 23, of Logan, Utah. Tech Sergeant Wyatt Dusenberry was the Enola Gay's flight engineer. He had flown in B-17s with Tibbets. Dusenberry could really get more out of engines than anybody else. He was a master at engines and that sort of thing. And best flight engineer I ever saw. Lieutenant Jacob Besser, 24, of Baltimore, Maryland, was a radar specialist. These bombs operated on radar proximity fuses. They had to very accurately measure the height above the ground to get their explosion. If the Japanese had gotten onto the frequency on which they had operated, they could have exploded the bombs in the airplane. But we didn't think that was a very good idea. So we took Jake along 
and Jake was our radar countermeasures expert. Filling out the Enola Gay's 12-man crew were PFC Robert Shamard, assistant flight engineer, Sergeant Joe Staborik, radar operator, PFC Richard Nelson, radio operator, and Tech Sergeant Bob Karen, tail gunner. During the first few days of August, Tibbetts gave considerable thought to a name for his airplane. He had no doubt that the first atomic bomber would become a celebrity of sorts, and the current identifier, plane number 82, didn't sound very heroic. He finally decided to name the plane after his mother, Enola Gay Tibbetts. She was a strong, caring woman who had much influence on Tibbetts' life and values. Bombardier Tom Faraby and navigator Dutch Van Kirk both knew Tibbetts' mother and both heartily agreed with his choice. On the 3rd of August, the final order came from General Curtis LeMay, who commanded all B-29 operations in the Pacific. The official order for Special Bombing Mission No. 13 listed Hiroshima as the primary target, followed by Kokura and Nagasaki. If the number 13 worried any of the crew, they never mentioned it. Over the next few days, Tibbetts and Faraby pored over huge aerial photographs of the three targets, especially Hiroshima. Faraby chose a landmark east of the city as his initial point where he would begin his bomb run. For the aiming point, he chose a bridge in the center of Hiroshima. Of the many bridges across the Ota River, the T-shaped Aeoe Bridge would be the easiest to spot from 31,000 feet above the city. With orders to drop the atomic bomb only if the target were visible, Tibbets wanted to be sure of the weather over each city. Not content to rely on long distance weather forecasts, he decided to send three B-29s ahead as weather reconnaissance planes. The planes would leave Tinian about an hour before the Enola Gay. They would fly over the primary target and the two alternates and report on weather conditions. Three other B-29s would leave Tinian with the Enola Gay. One carried scientific instruments to measure the intensity of the atomic explosion. Another carried cameras to photograph the mission and the blast. The third B-29 was a backup plane. It would follow the Enola Gay to Iwo Jima, about halfway to Japan. There, it would land and wait. If the Enola Gay had mechanical problems on the way to Japan, Tibbets would return to Iwo Jima transfer his crew and the atomic bomb to the backup B-29 and complete the mission. On the morning of the 5th of August, 1945, the forecasters said the weather looked good for a mission the next day. Final preparations went into high gear. The Enola Gay was moved to a loading pit while the bomber crew attended a mission briefing. By noon, the atomic bomb was loaded in the B-29's specially modified bomb bay. And then they told us to go get some sleep. How they expected to tell you you're going to draw and go out and drop the first atomic bomb, which might blow up the airplane, and go get some sleep is absolutely beyond me. I know Tibbetts didn't sleep, I knew Fairby didn't sleep, because we were all three in the same poker game. And I don't even know who won. It was that bad. The crews of the three strike planes were summoned again about 11 p.m. They came and got us, uh, final briefing, latest weather information, all that sort of stuff, air sea rescue, everything of that type. And uh, then over to the final breakfast. And I don't, I do know, I remember vividly what we had for the final breakfast. Paul Tibbetts loved pineapple fritters. I hated the damn things. We had pineapple fritters for breakfast that morning, that evening, I should say. The Japanese were known to be torturing B-29 crewmen who had been shot down over Japan. As Tibbetts left the mess hall, the flight surgeon handed him a small pillbox containing 12 cyanide capsules. Tibbetts gave one of the capsules to Parsons, but kept the rest to be handed out only in an emergency. Paul Tibbetts made it clear to the crew that if the plane were shot down, each man should decide on his own whether or not to commit suicide to avoid capture. 
the crew arrived at the flight line about 1.45 a.m. to find the Enola Gay bathed in floodlights. General Groves wanted the plane's departure from Tinian to be recorded on film. We got in trucks, went down to the airplane, and I think when we all got down there, we were all surprised because the plane was lit up by keg lights. Like a, it was like a Hollywood premiere, for heaven's sakes. Dick Nelson, who comes from Southern California, said, ah, oh, looks more like a supermarket opening to me. Point I want to make, if all the interviewing is being done, all the pictures are being taken and everything of that type, were being done by the Manhattan Project. There was no media on the island at all. The crew boarded the aircraft and went carefully through their checklists. No one wanted to make the mistake that would jeopardize the mission. We were very heavily loaded on takeoff. We were about 250,000 max gross weight, normal max gross weight of a B-129 over there. At that particular time, it was about 235, 235,000. At 2.45 a.m., Tibbetts began his takeoff roll on Tinian's 8,000-foot runway. As the aircraft reached 140 knots, its normal takeoff speed, co-pilot Bob Lewis reached for the control yoke. I was confident that this was the only way to do it so that I could control with the tail if I had to. So when I'm going down there and I kept it past that magic 140 that you knew it was used to, he started to grab the yoke and pull back on it. He said, lift it off. And I told him, I said, keep your goddamn hands off of that yoke. I'm flying this airplane. And he, he, he was in charge, absolutely not. That was Paul Tibbetts on an airplane. I don't know what speed we're coming off on, but I know we used every damn foot of that runway. At two minute intervals, the camera plane and instrument plane took off behind Tibbetts, followed by the backup B-29. Conventional bombs were usually armed on the ground, but if the Enola Gay were to crash on takeoff, Parsons worried that a fire could set off the atomic bomb's black powder trigger. As the Enola Gay reached its initial cruising altitude of 4,700 feet, Deke Parsons and Lieutenant Jepson climbed into the bomb bay to arm the atomic bomb. While Jepson held a flashlight, Parsons inserted a small slug of uranium and a small explosive charge that would fire one uranium slug into another and trigger the atomic explosion. I was worried to beat hell. The fact that we had an atom bomb behind me, right behind me, didn't concern me a whole lot. The fact that Deke Parsons was back there in the bomb bay, fooling with black powder, that worried me, because I, I knew what black powder would do. Arming task completed, the crew relaxed. Many of them slept, making up for the sleepless days leading up to the mission. The six-hour flight to Japan seemed routine and uncomplicated in spite of their unique payload. Use celestial navigation to get up to Iwo Jima, and if you get lost between Iwo Jima and Japan, you are the lousiest navigator in the world. I'm sure there's some people who've done it already, but uh, not many, because you had a volcanic island sticking up above the ocean, and uh, you could pick them up on radar and lead your way right in. At 5.55 a.m. Tinian time, the crew sighted Iwo Jima, halfway to the target. The backup airplane, a B-29 named Top Secret, landed there. Tibbets circled the island once to allow the two other B-29s, Great Artiste and an unnamed number 91, to form up on Enola Gay and the three planes headed for Japan, three hours away. At about 7.45 a.m. Tinian time, the Enola Gay climbed to 32,700 feet, her intended bombing altitude. Half an hour later, Tibbets received a coded message sent from Major Etherly, the pilot of Straight Flush, one of the B-29 weather reconnaissance planes. The weather over Hiroshima was suitable for a visual bomb strike. The other two weather planes also sent messages. The skies over Nagasaki were clear, but Kokura 
was hidden under ground fog. The skies over all three cities were empty of other Allied aircraft. Orders kept them well clear of the possible targets. About 9 a.m. Tinian time, the city of Hiroshima came into view, its white buildings gleaming in the morning sun. Dutch Van Kirk's navigation was near perfect, and the Enola Gay reached the initial point almost precisely on time. Tibbets turned the plane left to a heading of 263 degrees to begin the three-minute bomb run. We made the turn to the west. We wanted a bomb on a heading of 270. I missed it. Uh, we got on a heading of 263, and we just went in and dropped the bomb. Bomb run was very long. We were having conversations while we were on a bomb run. And now I, Tom Ferby turned around to me once and he said, Christ Dutch, if we'd have sat on a bomb run this long over Europe, we wouldn't be here. Well, I said, it's still on the target. He says, it's gone right down the track. He says, nothing I can do. You see, when the bombardier is making his bomb run, he's flying the airplane. It's an automatic pilot, everything of that type. And bomb, Tom was extremely good at it. An hour earlier, the B-29 weather plane, straight flush, had set off air raid sirens in Hiroshima, but no fighters rose to attack it. The Japanese had no defense against high-flying airplanes up until that time, and we were going to be as high as we could get. So we didn't expect any enemy action of any type on this particular mission, and we didn't get any. Ten miles out, Bombardier Tom Farabee spotted his aiming point, the T-shaped AEOE bridge. At 90 seconds from bomb release, Tibbets switched the autopilot and gave the plane to Farabee. The city of Hiroshima was one of Japan's principal seaports. It was an important shipping point for soldiers and equipment. It was also one of the landing points for the Allied amphibious invasion that was planned for November 1945. It was the headquarters of the Imperial Second Army, the Chigoku Regional Army, and the Imperial Army Marines. There were large military supply depots and many small factories for military goods in this city of 420,000 people. The Enola Gay's pneumatic bomb bay doors opened automatically at 9.15 and 17 seconds Tinian time. The atomic bomb tumbled away. Its burden gone, the Enola Gay pitched sharply upward. Tibbets now had to fly the world's largest bomber as if it were a nimble fighter plane. We made a right-hand turn, 60-degree bank, uh, uh, lost about 2,000 feet in the turn, pushed the throttles forward, just ran like hell. Tail gunner Bob Karen felt like the last man in a wild game of crack the whip. Dutch Van Kirk recalls one particular thought as the plane sped away from the release site. I hope it works. Because, you know, it had never been dropped before. Two days before, the fusing mechanism didn't work. I think if I'd have been a betting man, I would have bet before we dropped that bomb I was going to be a duck. So everything, was, everybody was waiting to see whether it did explode and did it work. And then suddenly we saw the bright flash in the airplane. Hallelujah, it had worked. After we were certain we weren't going to get any more shockwaves, we turned around to look what had happened. The first thing we saw was a mushroom-shaped cloud, all different colors within the base of that cloud. And on top of it was a mushroom, you could see. It was up well above our altitude already, I guess. Yeah. 40,000 going higher. And then as we turned on around and everything, we could see the city of Hiroshima and we could make absolutely no visual observation because the entire city was covered with thick black smoke and everything. You want a description of it? I say it looked like a pot of boiling oil down there. The initial fireball incinerated or vaporized everything in the immediate area of the blast. Beyond that, buildings were flattened, then set on fire. Four square miles of the central city were destroyed, about 60% of the city's area. 
the firestorm that erupted after the blast widened the destruction. Estimates put the human toll at 60 to 80,000 dead and an equal number injured. In Tokyo, many in the civilian government argued for surrender. The Russians were poised to attack Manchuria. The Allied blockade was strangling Japan. There were food shortages. Victory was no longer possible. But Japan's military leaders vowed to continue the war. America, some said, had no more atomic bombs. On 9 August, a B-29 called Boxcar, piloted by Major Charles Sweeney, dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki. The mission was flawed. The bomb missed its target by nearly half a mile, causing less destruction than at Hiroshima. That same day, the Russians invaded Manchuria. Two days later, a group of Japanese military commanders met in a plot to seize the government and continue the war. The plot failed when senior officers refused to join the coup d'etat. On 14 August, more than 1,000 American Army and Navy bombers hit Japanese cities. Faced with the total destruction of his nation, the emperor ordered the unconditional surrender of Japan. The atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki changed the nature of warfare forever. Atomic weapons elevated the role of the strategic bomber and helped give birth to the U.S. Air Force as a separate service. They shaped much of the military and political landscape of the second half of the 20th century. The decision to use atomic bombs on Japan, made jointly by Truman and Churchill, has remained controversial. But one fact cannot be disputed. The use of the bombs was intended first and foremost to end as quickly as possible a terrible war against a ruthless enemy who was determined never to surrender. Let me say emphatically that there's no way in those days that I could have even considered not wanting to do it. I was anxious to do it. I wanted to do everything that I could to subdue Japan. And in other words, I wanted to kill the bastards. That was the th attitude of the United States in those years. The Battle of Okinawa in early 1945 produced 50,000 Allied casualties and up to 150,000 Japanese casualties. If Japan fought on, Allied leaders feared a score or more of Okinawas to be fought all over Asia. If you were over there in around Tinian, uh, Saipan, uh, Guam at that particular time, you knew that an invasion was going to be have a lot of casualties because they were building hospitals all over those islands. We wanted a war to be over. We wanted to stop the killing. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was instrumental in ending the Second World War. Tibbets, his crew, more than a million American servicemen and women and the American public were overwhelmingly grateful for the peace that followed. And the memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki has helped to ensure that such weapons have never again been used in anger. I'd just like to say to all people that before you make any, say anything critical about what we did and the casualties we caused or anything of that type, study the history of the war, study the history of that people, find out what was really going on back in those days, and then make up your mind.